So tax season may be over, but your issues with taxes may just be beginning. Don't forget, guys, the IRS can audit your taxes within the last seven years. So if you have any issues or you think you may have issues with taxes, check out defensetax.com. That's defensetax.com. They can help you settle your IRS tax debt for a fraction of what you owe. They help remove interest charges and penalties, prevent or stop wage garnishments, remove tax liens, prevent and stop property seizures, and they can also prevent and stop bank levies. Defense Tax Group is a tax advocacy service dedicated to protecting individuals and businesses from the financial devastation that results from the IRS tax debt. And trust me, guys, there is nothing scarier than getting that letter in the mail from the IRS telling them that there is telling you that there is going to be an audit or that you have an issue with your taxes. An IRS tax problem not only affects your financial future, but can also jeopardize every area of your life. And that's not what any of us need, right? So check out defensetax.com or you can give them a call. 866-657-1040. That's 866-657-1040. Do you love coffee? And do you also like to support our veterans? Well, I've got an awesome place for you guys to go. It satisfies both. Go to killtheenemycoffee.com. That's right. Killtheenemycoffee.com. So what exactly is this? It's an active duty and veteran-owned small business. They're dedicated to bringing you this country's best tasting coffee through hard work and long hours of perfecting blends. Guys, I I don't just promote this just because I want to promote it. I've tried it. It's awesome. And the byproduct, an awesome feature of it is you get to support your veterans. It's a small business. And that's what this country was built on is entrepreneurial spirit and being able to start your own business and supporting veterans that have defended our freedom to be able to do something like this. So check out killtheenemycoffee.com. And yes, they obviously have coffee, but there's also some really awesome mugs. They have a gladiator mug and a a kill the enemy water bottle. Really, really high quality stuff, guys. Check them out. And by the way, the kill the enemy slogan, that means to conquer your demons. So check out killtheenemycoffee.com. So conquer your demons one cup at a time. Welcome to the WWE Podcast, your place for the most passionate wrestling analysis on the web. Just turn Roman heel. What is WWE waiting for? When other wrestling podcasts put you to sleep, you can count on the WWE Podcast to keep you engaged and asking for more. I've been watching wrestling for over 20 years, and that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. If you're easily offended, this may not be the show for you. Whatever happened to the men being able to physically retaliate against the women in WWE? This is a fantasy environment. This is unlike any other wrestling analysis. So without any further delay, let's get the show started right now. All right, guys, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining me on this Money in the Bank Sunday, May 19th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me, and today I have a co-host on the show. Her name is Mary Grader, and it was a great conversation about Money in the Bank, how she got into wrestling. We talked about the Firefly Funhouse, tons of different stuff, misbooking of of Samoa Joe and our love for Kevin Owens, just just so much different, so many different things that... um, Let me tell you, almost two hours went by in the blink of an eye. And (laughs) that is very common when you get two people who are together that love wrestling equally and have a history with it and grew up on it and are sticking with it through adulthood and will for the foreseeable future. So as WWE likes to say, it's then now and forever. And that truly is the case for a lot of us fans out there. So uh, let's not go to the normal housekeeping stuff. You guys know the drill. You guys know where to find me, all that stuff. So let's just get to the interview or the co-host, really. Not really an interview, but more of a discussion. Let's get to discussion on Money in the Bank and hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, everybody, welcome back. And right now I have a very special co-host for today to preview Money in the Bank her name is Mary Grader. She's a wrestling fan of over 30 years, so puts me to shame. I thought I was a big wig with 20 years, and uh, so she's been watching wrestling for over 30, so she has quite a knowledge base to pull from. She's very passionate about the product, and at this time, I'd like to welcome Mary to the show. Hey, how you doing? 
Good. Awesome. Um, so before we get into Money in the Bank, let everyone know just off the bat how they can reach you on Twitter and any other social media that you want to plug. Um, if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, my uh, handle is at MareBear, M-A-R-E underscore B-A-R-E, not like the bear, but bear like naked. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, my Instagram is at Poppins311. Awesome. So, guys, check her out there. Um, I know that I will be. So let's just get right into the, uh, the the reason why you became a wrestling fan. We'll get to Money in the Bank in a second. But I always like to ask this to people who have, who are new to the show. What brought you into wrestling? I know before we uh, press the record button here, we, we briefly spoke that you were pretty much brought up with it. And it was, and it was uh, a part of your life every yeah. week. And uh, what- yeah, pretty much. Um, my father, I have two older brothers that are much older than me, um, 12 and 7 years older. So you can understand that there was kind of generation gaps and things that uh, we didn't really do together. Uh, but wrestling was something that we all watched together. Um, my father was a huge wrestling fan. Um was watching it in the 60s and the 70s before I was born. So it just kind of became a thing where it was on on Sunday mornings. Like we had like one of those little black and white TVs in the backyard when I was hanging with the kids in the neighborhood. And, you know, I watched WCW with my dad in my early years and stuff like that. And watching WWE, obviously, or WWF at the time. So it was just kind of always on in the house. And it's it was kind of a bond between me and my brothers when we didn't really have that much other in common when they were so much older than me that's i love hearing that because i don't hear that often that it's you you know that you were brought up with it and um typically it's well you know i had to watch it on saturday mornings alone or maybe with a brother or a sister but it was a family affair for you that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome also the kids that grew i have a two-family house so the kids who grew up downstairs for me also watched it so i watched it with them they were actually more closer to my age than my brothers actually were so yeah it was just always around it was just always something that was in the environment wrestling was always on you know we got the bootleg uh vcr tapes of mm-hmm. pay-per-views on closed circuit when we didn't have cable my dad I would borrow it from friends and stuff like that and we just we watch it so yeah it's just always been a constant in my life so what would be if you were to look back like what was the thing that grabbed you was it a particular program a, a rivalry what was it that really you were like okay i'm hooked for life now I mean, when I mean when we were younger, I, I don't know if there was something particular that grabbed me. I was, and this is really random, a huge Bruce Beefcake fan when I was growing <laughs> up. I don't know why. Um, once I got into the Attitude Era, I was kind of like touch and go because uh, I was a teenager in high school. So, like, it wasn't a constant, but, like... I remember watching WCW with my dad and we were very big Hollywood Blondes fans. So I knew Steve Austin before Steve Austin was Steve Austin. So he was he was a constant that I remember. I remember Mysterio and WCW. It wasn't necessarily somebody or a storyline. I mean, the Hogan Ultimate Warrior storyline grabbed everybody, I guess. But I mean, I'm kind of a weird person where I'm not a huge Hogan fan and I wasn't a huge Hogan fan when I was younger. So it was more Bret Hart, you know, Shawn Michaels. The Rockers were absolutely one of my favorite uh, tag teams growing up. So it's kind of just, it was just always around. It was, it's just like, oh, what's your favorite? You know, and there were people in school. I got made fun of by the boys in school and girls because I was like one of the people who watched wrestling. But it was just, it was there. It was just something that was a part of my culture. And I just always loved it. It was just over the top ridiculous, you know, superhero stuff. So it was just that's it. And, and that's what you have to really just take it as. And, and that's why I don't know why out of all forms of entertainment that wrestling fans get the baddest rap and, and take the worst, like just criticism from people when honestly it is one should be one of the most respected forms of entertainment, considering the guys and gals that put their lives on the line on a daily Absolutely. basis in one slip, one miscalculation could leave them paralyzed or dead. I mean, some of the things that they do is it's just mind blowing. So before we get to money in the bank, just one last question. What, would be some of your favorite memories when you look back at your wrestling in, in the past 30 years like what when you look back you're like oh man I, that was awesome i mean there when i was younger like i said that that ultimate warrior hogan match i forgot what wrestlemania was but do you remember when they used to have like uh like uh the breaks that they used to have because WrestleMania used to be so long. I wish mm-hmm. they would do it now. They had intermission. I just remember that. I remember um, 
Ricky Steamboat and uh, Savage, or yeah, it was Savage. I think when Ricky Steamboat got his windpipe uh, kicked in, I don't know if you remember that. That was that was a huge thing. My brother was a huge Ricky Steamboat fan, and he was crying. <laughs> <laughs> He'd probably kill me if I say that, but he was really perturbed by that. Um, you know, we used to fake wrestle. I used to be Miss Elizabeth. There's just a lot of things. I mean, recently in the last like 10 years since I've been watching wrestling again, because I did fall off after Chris Benoit died, not to bring him up, but kind of killed the innocence for me. It's always been a childhood thing for me. It was like the one thing that was like from my childhood that like graduated into my adulthood. So I stopped watching, but, like, seeing CM Punk for the first time blew my mind. Like, he's one of my favorite wrestlers. I know I shouldn't mention him either, but, like, he's the reason why I watched during that period, because it was really bad. Um, AJ Styles showing up at the Royal Rumble a couple years ago. I, I marked out, you know, the Hardy Boys and Edge. I, I could go on and on, but there's a lot of things those pivotal moments that make wrestling worth it. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. everybody's like kind of down on the product right now, but you keep watching because you know, there's going to be a moment like that. And that's what I love about wrestling because it sucks you right back in. Like just when you have given up hope about something, something crazy happens that you wouldn't ever expect it to happen. So that's just it. And that CM Punk moment um, in Vegas, what in 2011, somewhere around 2012, when yes. he had that, the whole, the infamous pipe pipe on promo and he sat on stage and people were mystified by that because he just, as you just said for years, I mean, it was kind of a bland vanilla product. I mean, for... Even when he was there, like he was the only thing that like in that time period, not towards the end when he left, but like at that pivotal moment, there was, there was nothing going on. Even his straight edge society stuff, because I had to go back and watch that when I started watching again. He was brilliant, you know, and it was a shame. Him and John Cena's uh, feud was probably the closest we would get to a modern day, I believe, Rock Austin thing. And they just kind of they they didn't go with it. And I, you know, that's politics and wrestling for you. But like watching the two of them, that was the best that I ever seen John Cena. You know what I mean? So. It it, it it touched to go. Personally, I'll tell you a secret. I liked Punk's uh, promo against The Rock uh, when he said, you can't, uh, you know, I can't reach up to hit God or whatever with the gloves. I thought that was better than the pipe bomb in Vegas. But that's yeah. my personal opinion. And so. people thought when The Rock came back that he was going to scorch John Cena. He was going to scorch CM Punk. And The Rock felt rusty. I mean, The Rock, when he came back, yeah, he came back as the host of WrestleMania, and he was on fire that night when he came back, and everyone went nuts. But since that time, I mean, he went toe-to-toe with John Cena, who, to me, is one of the best, if not the best in the business when it comes to promos. I think he definitely outwit The Rock when it came to that part piece of it, and as well as CM Punk. CM Punk, who, everybody, watch out. He may show up in AEW. That's the latest. <laughs> I um, mean, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, can you imagine the the – press and the viewership that would spike for AEW if CM Punk were to show himself maybe yeah, double or nothing he, or yeah yeah he just he he's leaving money on the table I mean I know he doesn't ever want to you know wrestle again or I think that's just in the contents of WWE but like it's the same thing when Daniel Bryan's contract was almost up WWE knows that if you have like Daniel Bryan or CM Punk somewhere else you kind of got stiff competition and they have competition right now. Money in the bank is kind of being shadowed by all the stuff that's going on politically and money wise with uh, federations right now. But yeah, CM Punk and John Cena and the rock. I mean, the rock, the problem with the rock I felt when he came back is that he was scripted. He become a, he became a caricature of himself. It was like, he wasn't edgy Rocky. He was Rocky, but he still had his writer and he had to fit into a PG era. I mean, I believe that's why Steve Austin isn't around as much as we would like him to be because he could be on the show in some sort of form. Rock just felt rusty in the ring. Well, he looked rusty in the ring. He was gassed the whole entire time. He's huge now. You know, he's a, he's a movie star, but I mean, as far as the mic goes, Punk owned him that night. He owned him. And that's why that's my favorite promo by him because he took down the great one and people can disagree. But if you go back and watch that promo, CM Punk owned him that night because he was making ice cream jokes and stuff like that. And Punk was just straight out. I'm going to kill you, you know? So Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's and and you know what, like the Rock coming back as you just mentioned, he he didn't like you just said he was a character of himself, and I think he was playing a wrestler rather than feeling like he was a legitimate authentic wrestler. He didn't. He was like playing to play himself. It, it did feel very disconnected for me. I mean, is it awesome when the Rock comes back? Of course, Absolutely. I will watch. I love it. But you just feel like he's kind of like winking and nodding to the people that like who are actually you know um, connected to him outside of this business that go oh my god you're getting back into that stuff so he's i feel like he's not a hundred percent into it every time he's there um but all right so we're we're getting way off track but i I love this stuff this is this is great i mean this is what's great about wrestling (laughs) there are four hundred thousand ways to go with wrestling Mm -hmm. and each one of them leads down a road of like a four-hour conversation (laughs) and that's what's great about wrestling especially when you're talking to, to fans who have been watching a combined 50 years i mean it's it's awesome so let's get to money in the bank which is actually airing as we speak right now but we are going to play this clean and we are going to have our predictions and thoughts on these matches so Let's just start right at the top of the card, and I will toss it to you, Mary. The Raw and SmackDown Women's Championship, um, well, actually specifically the SmackDown Women's Championship for Becky Lynch versus Charlotte Flair. What are your thoughts? Um, I think that Becky is definitely going to drop a belt tonight. I don't think they're going to continue with this double championship, and I think out of the two with her and Lacey Evans, um, I think she's going to drop it to Charlotte. They, they want Charlotte to be a champ. And I think Lacey Evans, honestly, it's too quick for her, but they've done crazy stuff before, so it could be completely wrong. But they just want, you know, I feel like in a way they are trying to create like a crazy feud between Becky Lynch and Charlotte. And they have, you know, it's been going on for a while now. We're going on almost a year, almost a year and a half since, I mean, SummerSlam is when uh, Becky turned. So I, I I just feel that, you know, she's not holding on to both titles tonight. So I definitely think that Charlotte has the upper hand in this because they love Charlotte and they want to make her the greatest women's champ of all time because she's a flair. I agree. Uh, I, I'm on board with you on that one. I think that it's I mean, as much as we all love to say Becky two belts or wherever that catchphrase actually came from, I actually don't even know if it was. I don't a, even know where it came from either. It just kind of yeah, started it, saying it. It came up, and I'm thinking like I don't know if this was a organic type of uh, a nickname that they gave her or if it was manufactured by WWE. But I don't, I don't know. Like, I, it's it's catchy, but I don't really like. I'm not in love with it. Like, I'm not going to be really I'm sad that we can't it. use that come tomorrow night. Uh, so I'm with you. I think she drops the belt to Charlotte because I think they need to a create distance from each other as great as they are together. The, the chemistry they have, the, uh, the back and forth promos, all of that. And there's no denying that they are peanut butter and jelly together. They are great together, but I think it's time that they go their separate ways. Becky drops a belt. Fine. Have Charlotte take it, run the SmackDown end of things as the queen have her you know go into SummerSlam even as champion it's time just for these two to take separate roads and take separate roads for at least six months I mean I just need a break from this yeah, and I need it, so I, yeah I, I think that she does drop the belt here and I think that's a good thing because we're not going to have to see Becky overexposed in two different programs with two different people every single week so it's it's fine we've had our celebration with her winning at Wrestlemania it's time to just separate these two and make Becky feel special when she's there instead of overexposing her. Yep, absolutely. I totally agree. It's it's time they took a break. Like every great rivalry, uh, excuse me, I can't speak sometimes. <laughs> every great feud um, always has like, you know, breaks in between them and, and they go their separate ways and, and they run or rule whatever, you know, hen house they're in per se. So I think that at this point they need to let Becky and Charlotte be separated and build up the women's division again, because I feel like there's been a lot of backtracking since the whole women's revolution started and we need to start seeing more faces, um, having more title opportunities. Exactly. I mean, it's just a matter of also giving other ladies an opportunity to get in a title picture that doesn't just revolve around a single champion with two belts. So I think we're on the same page here. Um, definitely the universal championship, Seth Rollins and AJ styles. I'm going to take my uh, opinion on this first. I think that Seth Rollins retains. And the reason I say it's pretty straightforward, it's not very interesting, but when you have a WrestleMania win and you win that championship at the biggest stage possible in WWE, you have to keep it at least for three months in my mind for have in order to for it to mean something and Seth Rollins finally overcame Brock Lesnar 
and now he's going to face AJ Styles. Why they're giving this match away so quickly is actually kind of stunning to me. You'd think this is more of a SummerSlam match, that they would have kept these two apart on Raw and then have them come together at SummerSlam. But we're getting it early. I'm fine with it. I think it's this could easily be the match of the night. Um there's no question about that. I think Seth Rollins retains, though. I mean, I, I think he almost has to. I can't see AJ Styles winning here, especially after Seth Rollins just finally conquered Brock Lesnar a month ago. All right, guys. So you got to check out this website. It's called RoyalOutlets.com. So what exactly is it? Well, they got a bunch of stuff that they sell that's really high quality. But one of the things I want to talk about is a back posture brace. So why does this matter? Well, most of us have issues with back posture. We may, we may not even know it. And there's a product that they sell there. It's the Back Posture Brace. It comes in all different sizes. So small, medium, large, extra large, XXL, you name it, they got it. It also has fast, free shipping. So you got to really check this out. So what exactly does this have? Well, and what does it do? It improves your standing posture by using this the posture corrector, and it'll be aligned and trained your back muscles to achieve a long-lasting, healthy posture every day. So... It is also adjustable, it's comfortable, it's the perfect fit. Other consumers claim they fit most body types, but they offer products that only fit for smaller body types. They can guarantee that their product sizes will fit effectively on plus size and regular size body types. So check them out. It's a 100% satisfaction guarantee as well as a 30-day money-back guarantee. So check it out so at we all know that outlets.com and fix your and posture today. I use it myself. My yeah, wife uses it. It's you. great to, to calm your nerves too. and, um, and really eliminate it's anxiety. I think that AJ it's just going to wrong. really help you guys out. Like I, I promise you. So and, and right. there's a, a website that offers it and I've tried it and I can tell you that it's the real deal. It's USCBDoil.co USCBDoil.co but beyond helping with anxiety what down. else does it do? And well, you hear the rumors it promotes about, like, natural you know, sleep hormones, regulates stress hormones, as I talked about. Freedom, it also improves I mean, extinction, extinction AJ, learning, AJ which is the reprogramming of the brain's response in certain circumstances. WWE, so check this out, guys. Awesome. It he's helps better on fight the mic. He's cancer. It lowers the risk like of that. diabetes and obviously pain relief and inflammation and depression. So there's really no risk here, guys. Check out USCBDoil. Co today. But the other problem is, is with this match is that it looks great on paper. It is a dream match, but it's kind of falling flat on the promo side. And I, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because they're being heavily scripted or if it's they just don't have like a history to like go at each other. And I figured they would have done more with like an independent side, but. WWE does like weird stuff every now and then, but Seth is definitely a face of WWE. So I just don't feel like they're willing to take the title off of him right now. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I totally think Seth retains. I know he, you know, he overcame Brock Lesnar. Who knows what's going on with that? If Brock's going to be back. Um, so going into SummerSlam, we don't know what the, you know, this is kind of setting up tonight's tape review is like basically the road to SummerSlam starts. So uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think AJ is going to kind of be after him or they have something else in mind for him. But I think he comes back up against Seth and he eventually will take the title from him. Yeah, that very well could be. I haven't really thought about long term, but you're right. This is now the this is kind of like the uh, the Survivor Series to Mania that is money in the bank to SummerSlam. I mean, that's kind of where we're at right now. To me, I mean, I think of SummerSlam or Survivor Series as the, the, where the seeds are planted for SummerSlam or for uh, WrestleMania. So, yeah, I, I'm with you, too, that the build to this match is a bit disappointing. Um, maybe that's also, like you said, is where this feels a little bit flat. Um, the promos have been, as you just said, like some have... The only thing that I really took from it of, of, of value was when... Seth Rollins mentioned AJ Styles, hey, you know, you call yourself the face of SmackDown. SmackDown was doing pretty damn good before you came here. And, I mean, it's true. I've been thinking about that, too, that, you know, he calls the, the house that AJ Styles built. And I'm thinking, well, SmackDown originated, what, 1999? Mm -hmm. And it was pretty damn successful for, what, 15 years before you got here. So um, that argument I liked. Uh, but that it was kind of a just cookie cutter formula to get these two to feud. Absolutely. And it didn't feel like anything that was like 
uh, personal. It was, oh, I accidentally hit you, and now I'm going to accidentally hit you in ret- uh, retaliation, <laughs> and then we're going to we're going to talk about whether it was intentional or not, and, and put these two together, together as a tag team. I mean, it's it's very formulaic. It didn't feel special, and it should for two guys of this caliber. Absolutely. I mean, the two of them alone are huge. I mean, I can't say enough about them. They're two of my favorite um, competitors currently. Um, I love AJ Styles. I, again, I'll go back to when he debuted. I ran around my apartment I because I thought it would never happen. He was the one guy in TNA that I cared about. You know, I mean, I cared about other people, but he was the guy, you know, he was a superstar and it was just kind of horrible to think that he would never ever be on the big stage and everybody you know doubted that nobody would believe in him so yeah it's just it it seems underwhelming and it seems very formulaic but i i can hope and you know pray that this is leading to something bigger and that maybe he's going to be chasing him and that they're going to have you know a best of three or something like that and you know the final be at SummerSlam, but Again, WWD is wacky things, so I, I, I could just be talking from a fan perspective. But yeah, it, it, it's been kind of not as tier, top tier as you would think for two people of this caliber and this uh, height of performing, because the two of them are unbelievable in the ring and they have great chemistry. But it's definitely going to be the match of the night. They're definitely going to steal the show. I hope so. I mean, I thought about that, too, when AJ Styles went against Shinsuke Nakamura, and I was disappointed several times. I mean, that that was a match. Oh, I can't wait till those two face off. And now Shinsuke Nakamura is basically in oblivion I on mean, SmackDown they, they, Live. I mean, they've done Shinsuke wrong from the second he got called up to the main roster. It's just one of those things where they don't, you know, NXT doesn't translate to, to Raw and SmackDown, unfortunately, and they just don't get certain things. And they are, you, like you said, there's a formulaic formula or you know how they do things so shinsuke has had a had a terrible terrible run since he's hit the main roster in my personal opinion so yeah i I mean he as great of a performer as he is he has definitely underwhelmed i don't think all the responsibility can be put on wwe for that i think that shinsuke nakamura has to take a little bit of the blame here for for really being underwhelming um i mean yeah his limited english isn't it doesn't help obviously oscar's kind of in the same boat yeah um i i thought he started to catch something finally when he's he came up with that no speak english like yeah, well, that was hilarious and i was like yes like you could use that for a million different things like mm-hmm. that you don't you don't understand something conveniently and you can use that as the phrase and it's it's comedic but it's also can be very arrogant to use and i, I don't know i thought he would catch something with that and it just kind of petered out um and now he's well, still with rusev and they're losing on a weekly basis so uh you know but all right, um, I'm going to toss this one to you next, and that's the championship, WWE Championship with Kofi Kingston and Kevin Owens. Um, I, I'm going to be in the minority here, but I think Owens is winning tonight. I unfortunately think that Kofi is a transitional champ. I'm not saying that um, he's he doesn't deserve to be champ. He absolutely does. But this whole thing, I mean, the whole run up until WrestleMania was great, and I love Kofi. He's always a consistent performer. He seems like a really good dude and stuff like that. But Kevin Owens is Kevin Owens, and he has that it factor more so, and anybody can't deny it. He's a lifelong heel, He and he came back from injury, and it just kind of seems like, for some reason, they, they're, they're sweet on him. I mean... He cuts promos like no other, you know, like he he's he's basically my CM Punk now. Like, I love Kevin Owens. That guy is amazing. But I just feel they kind of put Kofi, they they put the title on Kofi just because they didn't want the same mistake that happened with Daniel Bryan. And I know that Daniel Bryan probably had a reason why Kofi Kingston got the title. Not that he isn't deserving, but I feel like they don't know where to go with him after that. So they're just, it's going to be a transitional thing, and it's unfortunate, but I think that Kevin Owens is in the right place at the right time, and I and I, I think he deserves the title. You know, he was a great universal champ, and I just feel like he's going to take the title home tonight. I... Man, this is this is not an easy pick, and most people are saying, oh, "Kofi, Kofi has to win." He just, you know, he just got the belt, and but but 
when you think about it, does he really, though? I mean, the fans have had time to celebrate and go, yay, Kofi got a good feel, feel good moment at WrestleMania. We all got to cheer with him. He all got his family in the ring, all of it. So is the bloom off the rose now, and the better choice is Kevin Owens to move forward? You can make a damn good argument for that. Um, I am very hesitantly going to go with Kofi Kingston, but that's by a just a, a frog hair. Like, I, I, I really... <laughs> There was another analogy, but I, it's a PG show. I really can't think of a closer pick on this because there is a really, really good argument for Kevin Owens here, and you just outlined it. Uh, Kofi Kingston, has he been a bad WWE champion? No, no, he hasn't. I think he's, he's done. Great. He's been great. He's that feel-good guy. He's the ultimate baby face right now. He's the guy that has scratched and clawed, never had a championship match in his entire 11-year career, has been the, the good soldier, has made WWE a ton of money, especially with his being involved in the New Day. There is, mm-hmm. There's a lot there that you could make an argument for Kofi, too, that you know he deserves to have a longer reign. But... Obviously, Kevin Owens is also on the, on the table here for being deserving, and he's a great talker on the mic. Yes, he's not in the best shape. I don't care. I don't think Doesn't WWE should matter. ever. Like, I hate that argument about people's size and shape and stuff like that. That guy can do things that I, I, I wouldn't have thought possible for somebody his size and he's slimmed down since he's been gone and when he was injured and on the shelf, but it shouldn't even matter. I mean, that guy... The things I've seen when he when he came to NXT was like the first real introduction. I knew who he was. You know, I, I'd seen a couple indie stuff with him when he was with ROH. But like when I saw what he was doing in NXT and like just doing the jumps and and all that stuff, I was just like, holy crap. You know, like it, you can't deny somebody for just being agile. Like he's just an agile dude and, and he deserves it. And, and, and like you're saying, I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. His, his mic skills are, you know, top par. I knew the whole baby face thing was a gimmick. He is one of those guys that always will uh, hopefully keep him a heel because that is where he shines and he's great. And he has, he's quick and he's witty and he's just a dominant person to be a champion. Kofi Kingston, yes, he's ultimate baby face right now. He's just, he doesn't have that dominant feel to me. You know what I mean? I, I wish, I wish he would be, but against Kevin Owens, I just, I can't see, I can't see him beating Kevin, o- Kevin Owens for multiple reasons. Kofi has the the feel good moment that Daniel Bryan uh, somewhat did at WrestleMania 30 when he beat Batista and Randy Orton in the triple threat. He kind of has that momentum with him. And to to kill it now, like I said, this is where it's so difficult to decide to to stop that momentum in its tracks right now. I don't know if that's the best thing for WWE, but like you, we're outlining why Kevin Owens is so awesome, and he is because he's in a, he's one of the few true heels left. I think Samoa Joe is also in the same boat. He's getting a massive disservice, and we'll get there. But I think Kevin Owens, like you just said, he look at the guy and you're like, no, he can't do these things. And then he does them. And I'm like, with that body, and I don't care how he looks, but you would never, ever assume that he can do the things he can do with the shape that he's in. And I don't care. I think he is, he is to me, one of the most underutilized uh, guys on the roster. It deserves a, a massive long reign as a champion. And it could very well start here. I'm fine with it if it does. Um, you know, I, I just don't want to see him in the role that he was with with Braun Strowman. When really Braun Strowman was being the bully and f- mm-hmm. for no reason just going after Kevin Owens, tipping him over in porta potties with, you know, bathroom humor, all that garbage. I mean, he, yeah. he did nothing to Braun Strowman and yet we're supposed to side with Strowman. I guess that was part of his heel turn that never worked. I don't know. But you're right. Kevin Owens is a heel through and through. We all knew the baby face was an act. It was just a matter of when is the other shoe going to drop? Mm-hmm. And it, it, I think, you know, while you could say, well, it dropped a little soon. Well, we all knew it was coming anyway and and you know I, it, this may be the reason why to get the belt off of Kofi um, but we'll, we'll see I am very torn I would not put money on this match <laughs> if I were anybody this is one where I put the money in my wallet and keep it there because I, I really don't know but I'm going to say Kofi Kingston I mean going real quick right back to it it is a hard decision I mean they could just keep it on Kofi I wouldn't be surprised if they do like it's not going to be like I'm going to be like I right, am but like what you're saying about uh, Kevin Owens Kevin Owens was my guy for a long time who I thought was going to dethrone Brock Lesnar. I thought it was perfectly logical. You know, Brock Lesnar is this huge guy and he's a beast and nobody, you know, nobody compares to him and size and quickness and it's Brock Lesnar, you know. 
But the whole time, if, if Kevin Owens didn't get injured, I thought that Kevin Owens was the guy, you know? Kevin Owens, it, and it, it was believable. That's the other thing. Like, Kevin Owens is a beast, even if he's not in, like, incredible shape like Brock Lesnar is or, you know, totally muscular. He has he has the size, he has the ability, he has the agility, and, you know, he's a smart wrestler. So, uh, like I said, I, I won't be surprised if Kofi wins tonight or retains, but I, I'm going with Kevin Owens. And he's got the mean streak. Yeah, he may not be able to outpower you, but he's got the mean streak, that power bomb on the apron, yes. the relentlessness, the ruthlessness, the, the 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 psychology in the ring. That's where Kevin Owens makes you believe that he's a true badass. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, he's not Brock Lesnar, but I, he doesn't have to be. So tonight I think Kofi retains. I think Sami Zayn interferes where you think that, Maybe Kofi's going to lose, and then maybe the return of uh, uh, Big E. I mean, who knows? I, I think somehow, some way, that Kofi will squeak by, but I don't believe that this program is over, much like I don't believe AJ Styles and Seth Rollins is over. So um, let's get to another one that is actually not as easy either, and I'm going to toss it to you again because i got to think about this one still. I have notes, but I'm not confident. Roman Reigns versus Elias. Uh, I, I mean, I think this is easy for me. I think it's Reigns. <laughs> like, maybe that's a biased thing. I just... They like every time I've every time I have thought since Roman Reigns has gone solo that he's going to lose something, he wins. So I don't think that it's any different now that he came back after his cancer scare and and leukemia, which I totally think is a 100 percent thing. I just I, I don't see it like they have something really special in Elias. And it's weird because he he rubs me the wrong way and I don't know if he's doing that on purpose and that and that's the point you know but he's awesome like he's a good Mike guy you know the whole gimmick it's it's a better honky tonk man Jeff Jarrett whatever um but it kind of seems like when they have characters like this or guys like that and I mean he's huge he's got the size he's he's a good in-ring worker it's Roman Reigns I just don't I just don't I, like they like they are still on that ship and it's unfortunate to me and this is a personal uh, feeling i feel like them continuing doing promo packages and video packages about him coming back from the leukemia scare is is in bad taste at this point like i thought they were gonna like okay for like the first two weeks or whatever, three weeks. Okay. Yeah. Like whatever. They're going to talk about it and then just move on and just let it be Roman Reigns, you know? And there's, they're continuing with it. And it's, it's, it bothers me that they're milking it because I've never had a personal problem with Roman Reigns. I think he's a great in ring performer. I think when he's not super scripted, he's okay on the mic, but they just, it's just something that they won't let go with him. And I just don't think he can lose. And I, 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 I just, I can't, I can't see why he's winning tonight. <laughs> like I want to, I really do. I think it would move the story along, you know, but it's just another notch on the belt for Roman Reigns. And that's how I view almost everybody that Roman Reigns fights, unfortunately. And that's why I think there's still backlash, you know, cause you you want to see him struggle, uh, and I just I don't I I see Roman Reigns winning tonight, not Elias. So, yeah. <laughs> now oh, there's so much I want to say. <laughs> um, so, when you say they. I think we really should say he because I think that one person is Vincent Kennedy McMahon, yes. who just will not, for whatever reason just get off of this Roman Reigns bandwagon. And they have all the reason in the world now to try to use, and unfortunately at this point, as you said, it's kind of in bad taste, kind of explo um, exploiting the yeah, cancer exploiting. that he had beaten. And good, good for him. I think that's awesome. Am I going to cheer Roman Reigns now? No. I think what's happened is that the guys, and, and let's be honest, it's mostly the male audience, the, the, the 18 to 34 year old demographic of men who have stopped booing rather than, the those that demographic cheering so while the, the reaction may be more positive although it started to go the other way the I, I think it's just the fact that though that demographic that booed him is just silent while the the women and children get to cheer him 
And I think that's more of it than my demographic who are now like, yay, go Roman. Um, but uh, you're, you're, you're right. Like this is a train that Vince McMahon just will not get off of. And I am all for Roman Reigns being in. I'm not never, ever. Have I ever said that Roman Reigns should be fired, moved to NXT, demoted? Never, not. never. That's not. I, I think he is easily one of the best talents that WWE has as a whole. Are his promos lacking still? Yes. Um, is he really good in the ring? Yes. He has the look. He has the, the the really silky hair, the steel blue eyes, all of that sex appeal that the women love, but he is still not yet connected with that 18 to 34-year-old demo that WWE, well, actually older than that now, that, that WWE seems to kind of shove to the side at times when they decide to handpick their guy. And right now, Roman Reigns still seems to be behind the scenes their guy. Like, they're still grooming him for the the... the now universal championship on monday night raw which eventually it will end up with probably seth versus roman mm-hmm. um, but again. yeah and and <laughs> again i think when you put roman reigns in the ring with seth rollins guess what's going to happen you're going to go right back to pre-cancer reactions yeah i mean absolutely. And, and yes he has uh, he has definitely improved on the mic as you said less scripted is always better for him but he always even when he's not scripted you can tell it's more of joe speaking than roman reigns the scripted character that vince mcmahon is obsessed with it still feels like he's not interested or excited to be there. He just kind of like is so laid back that it, it comes across as, well, yeah, I'm, I mean, when I'm here, I'm excited. But when I go home, I don't really think about any of this. Like, I'm just here because this is my job. Like, I want it to feel like this is his life and death. And I don't get that. I don't get that from Roman Reigns. So my my pick after all of that is, <laughs> is, um, is still Roman Reigns. Um, I was hesitant because they're clearly trying to position Elias as a formidable threat. They have yet to do that with Roman Reigns um, beating Drew McIntyre very easily at uh, at WrestleMania. I think that this is the same thing's going to happen here. Elias will put up a good fight. I actually forgot that he was a wrestler because of how I mean he comes out. I'm like, oh, he came he came out in like a wife beater, and I'm like, oh yeah, like he's not just you know he's not just this guy that you know for six months straight comes out and you know plays a guitar and runs down the city that he's in or the sports team that he's you know that's local i'm like oh yeah like he can wrestle and is he great in the ring no but i think that he can be a a a serviceable opponent for roman reigns as you just said kind of a stepping stone or a notch in roman reigns belt on his journey to the universal championship yeah i mean the other thing with roman reigns is is that like you got to look at the history they've had so many opportunities to make Roman's character better. I mean, going back to Royal Rumble 2015, I mean, oh. he, like with Batista, you know, and that was the whole beginning of the Daniel Bryan stuff and the CM Punk stuff and like all that, all that stuff. I mean, I said it on Thursday, he teamed with the Usos and I tweeted out, I was like, right now would be a really good time to, for them to run with this. They're cousins. They're Samoan have Roman be the leader of a Samoan stable. And it doesn't necessarily have to be bad or good, but it would be a good opportunity for him because he was always better in the shield. You know, when he was with Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, personally, now I'm not saying his in-ring skills, it's always been the same and stuff like that, but his character was always more popular when he was in the shield, when he was, you know, the silent but deadly type. And, they, you know, that's an opportunity. And I don't even know what they're doing with the Usos right now. Like, they're taking the Usos back to before they went kind of thug, which is awesome. And it works. And they're, they are one of the best tag teams that have been in the last 25 years. And they're doing, you know, shaving jokes with the Revival, which is obscene. Like, the Revival is supposed to be old school. Again, I say they. It's Vincent Kennedy McMahon. And it's... It's getting that's why I said earlier in the podcast that this kind of this pay-per-view is supposed to be super important. It's one of the top four now. Like you can switch out Survivor Series at this point with Money in the Bank. In my personal opinion, Money in the Bank is more important than Survivor Series. And they just they're it's kind of in the shadows right now because all these rumors are going on and all this stuff is going on with people asking for their release and people being fired and stuff like that. And you know, Vince is Vince and he created all this world that we love, but it's it's kind of time to like step aside. And that's kind of outshadowing this pay-per-view right now. So anybody watching this is obviously going to think Roman Reigns is going to win. 
despite whatever we just said for the last five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think we can talk until we're blue in the face about Elias possibly winning, but yeah, the, the more that we talked about it, it's kind of a slam dunk. This is one that if I did bet on this, I think you'd be pretty safe on Roman Reigns winning. Now, that's not to say that Elias can't, or Roman Reigns can't win via DQ, where Elias, you know, ends up brutalizing Roman Reigns with a chair, you know, and, and Roman Reigns gets the de facto win. You, you could extend it that way, rather than Roman Reigns just buzzsawing through Elias, um, which I don't think would be good for Elias, because they put Absolutely a hell of a lot not. of time into Elias. I mean, they re- think about how many times that, how much TV time this guy gets. Yes, it's not in the 20 by 20 competition of wrestling but it's it's via his guitar backstage inter, interacting with how many legends that have interrupted him and him taking the you know the bump and and all that like he's they've invested a lot of time in them for, so so it's just not beneficial for wwe to completely pour water on on elias just for the fact of roman reigns getting the clean victory it's all about roman let's just get him in the title picture and so he can you know become champion i mean i i just always feel regardless of what roman reigns is doing and what program he's in that it all roads lead to roman reigns holding a championship with vince mcmahon smiling backstage with his headset on while the crowd goes crazy that at least in my mind that's what vince mcmahon probably wants to happen at the end of the day that's vince mcmahon's end game so Unfortunately, though, I, we just brought up the 2015 Royal Rumble. I mean, I could go on forever <laughs> about this, and we'll move on after this. But uh, Roman Reigns in the 2015 Rumble, and I have said this since it happened. That was to, I was so happy with the Philadelphia crowd that night. I, I loved it. Even The Rock. The Rock couldn't save Roman Reigns that night. The face and that Roman, The Rock had when he came it, out. Is it, there's a meme on that. I, oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> It is. It was awesome. Like he, you know, he held his hand up. He's pointing to Roman, and he's kind of looking at the crowd, like, "What the hell's going on here?" And it was awesome because even The Rock was like, "I did not see this coming." Roman is going about like nothing's happening, still with a stupid smile on his face. The Philadelphia crowd is completely destroying him, and yet they continue to move forward with Roman Reigns as champion in the WrestleMania main I mean, event. I was I was specifically talking about when um, Roman Reigns should have won the rumble when daniel bryan didn't come out after he lost and batista won but that rumble yeah i mean but this is also you're not listening to history like i've also said with this whole roman reigns thing look what happened to the rock when the rock first debuted he was getting the same treatment and they're cousins so why wouldn't you go the die rocky die way with with Roman Reigns, like you're so hung up on the on the attitude error sometimes, and like you keep bring, bringing back all these people that nobody really cares about, and you don't really move on, and now you have Roman Reigns in the same situation that The Rock was in when he first debuted, and they made him this baby face, and everybody was like, "What? You never know." how somebody's going to shine unless you change them. And like, there are people that are supposed to be baby faces forever. And there are people that are supposed to be heels forever. I think it happens more so often with heels, but they haven't even tried it. And he's only been a heel when the shield first debuted and you still weren't even sure if they were heels or not. So it's just, <laughs> Again, mm-hmm. we could go. We could talk about this all night. We could have a separate podcast about Roman Reigns' character, and it's a shame too, because everything that you said about him is right. Everybody's like, "Oh, if you boo Roman Reigns, you hate him." No, that's that's not it. I feel it's unfortunate what they're they they put this this banner on him that clearly isn't working, and unfortunately, we live in a time and era where it's just, you know, the fan is the fan, and they're not going to take it because it's a cult niche group of people that watch wrestling. And there are a lot of things that you could do to save Roman Reigns, but unfortunately, tonight's not tonight. <laughs> no, it's not. And it, look, I've been, I've been advocating for him to turn heel. Just turn heel so we can hate you and then learn to love you. I mean, it's a simple formula. Why they, and, and on top of the fact that they fast-tracked him from basically being hidden in the shield where his weaknesses can be hidden, and he's that strong, silent type, as you said, to fast-tracked to not even get an Intercontinental Championship right to the main event picture. And it's like, yeah, okay, so you bring in a guy that we don't really know that is was in NXT for basically a cup of coffee, hides in the shield, 
we all think, oh my God, he's mysterious. And then they fast track him to the main event uh, above and beyond Daniel Bryan, who, yeah, that was bad timing for Roman Reigns because you have Daniel Bryan, who is the grassroots homegrown boy that is a super relatable guy, really good on the mic, and we want him. He's our guy. And Vince McMahon's like, no, 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 no. Trust me, you guys. This is my, this is the guy you're going to like. It also goes and, back to, not to cut you off, but it also goes back to, to uh, Vince McMahon wanting his product. Roman Reigns is a WWE born and bred. It's the same thing with John Cena. You know, even though John Cena, I'm sorry, in retrospect now, even as much as I hated him during the years, he's WWE homegrown. Daniel Bryan's an indie guy. This all goes back to the fact that Vince is still looking for that guy. Every guy that's been other than John Cena that's been their huge thing and The Rock has been somebody else. Like Stone Cold Steve Austin was WCW, you know, and he did everything for Stone Cold not to succeed. So it's just one of those things, and and again, we could do a separate podcast uh, about. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting all fired up now, so <laughs> I, I'm because I, I I can see myself going down a road that I'm not going to come back. So let's move on. <laughs> let's move on to uh, the Miz and Shane McMahon in the steel cage match. I'll give you my thoughts on this one. Um, you know, as much as I would like to say the Miz wins this one and should win this one, this one scares me too because Shane McMahon, for whatever reason, and I, I'm a Shane O'Mac guy, I like Shane McMahon. What I don't like is the Shane McMahon that we are all supposed to believe that a 50-year-old guy can go toe-to-toe with world-class athletes, go toe-to-toe with The Undertaker, go toe-to-toe with Randy Orton, go toe-to-toe you know, with, with AJ Styles at WrestleMania. We're all supposed to believe that that's the guy that, that exists with Shane McMahon, and, and that's the problem that I have with Shane, and that's why I'm not a fan of his character, but I like Shane O'Mac, who's a, who's the heel authority figure. I actually really like Shane as a heel. I think he was is better as a heel, to be honest with you. And The Miz, surprisingly, has been very successful as a babyface, who for almost his entire career, if not his entire career, was a heel. And he turned face, and it's been so far pretty darn successful. So I, I think that, sh- that uh, Miz wins this one, but Shane scares me because... He will find a way, maybe it's via interference or what have you, that Shane McMahon wins this. So based on – actually, you know, I'm going to flip my decision because if Seth Rollins wins (laughs) – see, I'm talking myself out of this. Seth Rollins wins. If Kofi retains, Roman Reigns wins. I'm going by – that's a lot of babyface wins on top of – well, no, Becky's going to drop. Okay, I'm sticking with Shane McMahon. I'm going Shane. I think Shane wins this one, and the feud somehow, some way, continues between these two. Because honestly, I've actually enjoyed this program. This is the one that that at WrestleMania I, I even enjoyed their match. Some people are going, oh, "The match wasn't that great." I think they did a really good job. I enjoy the physicality. They told a good story with Shane getting personal with uh, with his dad and all that. So I think Shane takes this match and again squeaks by somehow and this feud continues and we get the blow off at the next pay-per-view. Um, I'm in, well, now your final decision. I was going to say Shane from the beginning. Um, this match is kind of a conundrum in a way because I think she's going to win just because he's Shane McMahon and they've been pushing him. For some reason, I feel I agree with everything you said about Shane McMahon. I was so happy when he came back. He was a breath of fresh air. Um, you know, he was great. He still is. I mean, for being his age, taking the beatings that he has, but he's never been a full wrestler. He's always been kind of like a sideshow, like gimmick kind of thing that, you know, the, the boss's son. God, there's so many levels of this. Shane, I just feel like he's going to win because he's the authority and they're going with this. But I also was thinking while you were talking about it, I feel like this whole best in the world thing has been bothering me for the beginning because I keep going, is is Punk coming back? Is this a long-term mm-hmm. dig at him? Like, it's just a weird thing. And all the matches that you just said could have been interchangeable with CM Punk. I, I, and I'm not trying to like be like conspir- I'm a conspiracy theorist. I think these things all the time. It's not like me being biased towards him. But I just feel that Shane McMahon's going to win because that's the way that they're going. I don't think this is the end of their rivalry. The rivalry, the feud has been great. It's been awesome. I've been into that storyline. It's probably the best storyline that they have going right now. If you want to talk matches and stuff like that. I mean, are they the best? Yes, no. You can you can make an argument about that, but as f- far as storyline goes, 
it's been really good. And and WWE, as of late and in very many years, have a problem with long term stuff. So that way, it's great. The Miz, the Miz is so crazy to me because everybody hated him. And now he's got this really good baby face thing going. And I don't know if it was Maurice. I don't know if it was the baby thing. But at some point, that guy just switched, and he's been great. And nobody gives him enough credit that he has paid his dues, and he's never really been injured. He's always been consistent, except the figure four. I will point that out for a while. It was really, really terrible, and the whole Ric Flair passing. But... I mean, it, it's it's a good it's a good storyline. It's a solid thing for them, but I just think Shane wins because I don't think it's over, and that's the only reason I think that Shane. I think Miz. They're trying to make Miz this baby face because he's he's doing a really good job of it. He's one of the best on the mic, and I love him now. I, I used to hate him. I love him now as a heel, but like I really, really, really have appreciated all the work that he's done recently as as a baby face since he's turned. And I think that the, the steel cage match, oh, the, the the whole slogan is that, well, there's nowhere for Shane to run or hide, and well, is, except the fact that's that hey, there's no roof. That's his best place, though. That's his, yeah. that's his dungeon. Like, if anything about Shane McMahon, if you know, he is a gimmick match guy. He's a guru. Like that is his that is his home. He he thrives there. So it's that's that's a weak thing where they say that. Yeah. And honestly, I don't even like the fact that you could escape the cage and win. To me, it should be pinfall or submission yep. only. Because think about how, like, these guys are world class athletes. All you would have to do to win the match is Irish whip the guy or gal into this <laughs> other corner and literally run out the door. I mean, and you win. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's also, yeah, I mean, that that is a. To me, just come on. It's it's a, just a little bit eye rolling. But I just suspend my disbelief and we move forward with it. And, um, with with Shane McMahon, I, I think this yeah this continues. Um, I, you know, I think that your answer to when the Miz really turned face was for me at least when he and Maurice were Im- um, mimicking John Cena oh and Nikki God, Bella so in, in their house <laughs> and the house rules and all of that stuff. That was oh my God, I, it was so funny because it was so true. Absolutely. And it, it, to me, that's when he really. I mean, I know he was playing the heel at that point, but. It was awesome. Because uh, I mean, everybody, pun intended. reason, I mean, uh, that's when weird face turns happen because everybody wants to hate John Cena and Nikki Bella. Like, it's just, like, you just want, if you watch, like, the TV shows, like, I, I tell everybody I hate watch Total Bellas and Total Divas. Like, you want to you wanna, you wanna hate them, you know? You want a reason. And for somebody to pick out their flaws and, and to show the reasons why you hate them, yeah, it makes them the face, makes them relatable. Yep. Uh, I mean, I really just, I loved it. And I think that the Miz, <laughs> that, Great. It's, I mean, it's now I'm going to probably go YouTube it after this. Well, I got Game of Thrones, but then I will. Um, it is uh, just th- that genius, that comedic genius. And the Miz has always been awesome on the mic. He is got a really good silver tongue on him. And he's had it since day one, since he came in as the, the guy from the, the real world. I mean, and he took, it took him a very, very long time to shake that image and, and that uh, history that he had with the real world of MTV that is just a reality guy coming in here. And he's stuck with it. And he has been extremely successful since then. So, um, okay, moving on to a very easy soft landing prediction. This is one where we just get to just take a breather and go, <laughs> yeah, this has to be it. The Raw SmackDown or the Raw Women's Championship, Becky Lynch versus Lacey Evans. I'm just going to say Becky Lynch because it's too soon for Lacey Evans. Although I have really, really enjoyed Lacey Evans more than most people have. Um, I think that she, her promos are slow, but in a way that's not annoyingly slow where I can absorb what she's saying. I like her, her cadence, her pace in her promos where some people just rush and talk and you don't know what they're saying. Lacey slows it down and you know what she's saying. She's a sassy Southern belle is a little, is a little bit hokey eh, at times a little bit, but I think she, she's got legitimate credentials. She was in the military. I believe she was a, a drill sergeant. I, I think in the Marines, I think she was a, a officer. Maybe oh, I, I, yeah. I, I was in, in, in military. I know so, that. I, yeah. So she has military experience, which instantly adds credibility to her. Um, it, it's a very unique gimmick. Uh, it needs time to breathe and grow, and that's fine. But uh, it's way too soon for her to win here. I think Becky Lynch takes this one hands down. Um, I agree. Uh, Becky's got to retain a title. She has too much momentum behind her, even though I think it's kind of gotten stagnant in the last couple of months. I don't know why that is. 
Um, but I mean, Becky has proven herself to be a good champ. Um, I love the man gimmick. Uh, I hope it gets more, uh, cutthroat like it was when it first started. I, I, I don't care so much about, uh, the Twitter wars and stuff like that, even though she's been absolutely brutal on Twitter. Um, as far as Lisey Evans goes, she must be doing something right because I can't stand her. <laughs> like <laughs> she rubs me the wrong way. Maybe it's being a girl and like the uh, reading into it too much and the projected image that they're trying to say that women should, you know, their places in the kitchen and stuff like that. I mean, the girl's a beast though. She's, she's got huge shoulders. I respect the fact that she was in the military. You know, she can kick butt if she needs to. Um, but yeah, she's too green. She's too new. It's not like where it's a page thing where you knew AJ was, AJ Lee was leaving where they're going to drop title on her. I mean, Paige has so much promise and stuff like that. But it seems to be one of the NXT gimmicks that are actually transitioning properly to the main roster. So I think where you're saying we were promos, they irritate the crap out of me. And I think that's what she's supposed to be doing. So she's a really good heel. Um, I hope they don't like go like, oh, she's got to be patriotic at some point and, and turn her face. I'm sure they will. But um, I haven't seen enough of her. I mean, what I saw of her in NXT, I was, eh, okay, you know, she she seems to be a homegrown talent. They might get behind her. I've heard rumors that Vincent, Vinny, Vinny, Vince, whatever his name is, um, is very high on her. So, but there's no there's no option. Becky's got to win here um, just to continue her, her reign. I think they have really good solid champions in Charlotte and Becky, as you said, we said earlier, separated. So Becky's that makes me, you know what? That makes me really happy because I don't hear that too often from people that, Oh my God, I just can't stand them. They make me so angry. That's the job of the heel. Like that doesn't happen too often today where people just, sometimes you get a heel that's just trying to be cool and just trying to maybe get a pop from the audience. But Oh yeah, by the way, guys hate me. I mean, it's kind of like Elias who just, he continues to do his sing-alongs where WWE stands for and everyone sings along. I don't know any really good heels in the last 20 years that allow sing-alongs with them. And yeah. Lacey Evans, it, it, there's no redeeming qualities about her. As you just said, she, you ran it down. And, and I think that having Lacey Evans on the roster say, you know, if she said that all the women's places in the kitchen, well... That, that's a woman saying it to women. At least it's, if it was a man saying oh, it yeah, as a gimmick, that'd be, I mean, well, my, forget it. I mean, the, the Twitter, I mean, seriously, the internet would physically somehow explode. So, no, I mean, I totally understand the logic of that in 2019 and all of that, but she's also a woman saying it to women. But, um, so you, you have that dynamic. She hasn't really grown yet. She's only been on the main roster for what, like, a month and a half since right after she WrestleMania. She hasn't really so, wrestled that much. So. No, she hasn't. So I'm not expecting a five star classic. I'm not expecting st- uh, fl- uh, st- what is it? St- uh, Flare and Steamboat. There we go. Uh, but I am expecting a match that is serviceable. Probably two and a half, three stars. Becky gets a solid win, and we move on to her dropping the belt to Absolutely. Charlotte. It's totally going to go on before Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah, that that way she's they'll think that oh my god Becky Lynch is retained can she keep both belts and yeah, the answer guys is absolutely. no so um all right so let's get to the women's money in the bank ladder match because we had a replacement late this week with uh with Alexa Bliss going down presumably with another concussion and Nikki Cross takes her place so the somehow unexplicably now soft. Nikki Cross, who is trying to just help people. I have to backstage. cut you off real quick, but I was watching her. Yeah, I saw that. I saw I saw her probers, but she was still acting like a maniac in the ring during the Fatal Four. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, so, what is going on right now? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe she's 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 just drawing within her inner Fatal festus, four? where you know the, <laughs> the ring bell suddenly makes her insane or or what? I don't know. Um, yeah, it, it makes no sense that. You have her backstage just kind of like, oh, hey, guys, what's going on? You know, like, oh, how are you doing? You, you need some help in a match? Uh, yeah, I'll help you. Cool. And, and of all people, she trusts Alexa Bliss. And of all people, and if she, you know, you'd think that these, these women would watch their own product and look at the history of what happened with Nia Jax, what happened with Dana Brooke. I mean, like, 
Think about everything that and everybody that she's been associated with, how that's ended up. Nonetheless, you have Nikki Cross taking her place. I was that makes me kind of sad. I was excited to see Alexa Bliss back, um, and I think she would have been easily the front runner and would have been my prediction if she had her. won. I know that um, might be some people like kind of gotten sick of her, but I love Alexa Bliss. I think she's fantastic. Oh, she's amazing. She's got a presence. She can speak. She has everything, and to see her once again get sidelined, I mean, I feel for mm-hmm. Lexi Kaufman, the the woman. I feel bad yeah. for her because she has to be just seething that, oh, my God, finally get back in the ring, and this happens again. Um, so my pick out of, let's see, we got Mandy Rose, we got Dana Brooke, we got Alexa, or um, uh, Nikki Cross, Bailey, uh, who else? Uh, who's that? Carmella, we've got Naomi. I, I think that ultimately it's going to be Mandy Rose. I know that some people may not agree. That's kind of an under um, under the radar pick. I'm going to go with Mandy Rose. And the reason I'm going with Mandy Rose is because they have really started to focus on Mandy Rose kind of uh, behind the scenes a bit over the last couple of months. It makes the commentators go berserk. I mean, you have, uh, what's his name on, on commentary, who is just infatuated with... Uh, um, yeah, Corey Graves. He is, for whatever reason, like a 14-year-old boy when she comes out. I, I'm not following it. It seems a little bit sophomoric. But, I mean, so I'm going to go with her. I'm going to go with Mandy Rose because I think she would be a good heel um, car- uh, briefcase holder because I think this match, just like the men's, is designed for a heel to win. So that's my pick. What about you? Um, this match is very weird to me because there are a lot of, like, looking at it, it's just random names other than, because, like, you have, like, Natalia and Naomi who are, like, the veterans in the match, like, if you think about it, and then you got Carmella who won and won, you know, stupidly, um, the first one, and then you got a lot of new people, and I still consider Bailey kind of new because she has had a terrible raw or main roster run unfortunately her gimmick does not translate to uh the main roster and that's unfortunate but i don't think there's anywhere else for her to go like she's a great in ring performer but the person like the way she looks and stuff like that unfortunately she has nowhere and it does nothing for me she does absolutely nothing for me i know everybody was huge bailey fan in nxt but she it it just it doesn't work for me um i'm gonna go kind of with you in a random person i'm gonna say dana brooke i just feel like they have done random things before and like they did it with carmella And they like sometimes putting things – they kind of did it with Alexa. Like, Alexa had a couple of rings, but, like, you didn't think that Alexa Bliss was going to win, you know, the money in the bank. This is also a very new thing for the women. So I just – I don't see them giving it to Natalia or Naomi because why? I'm saying not that as me. I'm saying that as they just don't see the point of, oh, well, they're, you know, they're old veterans and stuff like that. Nikki Cross was just added to the match who – I absolutely think has this thing, if they figure it out right, will be a force on the women's roster. But like you, we just discussed, uh, they I, I don't know what they're doing right now where she's soft-spoken. It's unfortunate that she wasn't with Sanity. She was great being a woman and a bunch of crazy dudes. I relate to that so much. Um, but I see Dana Brooke just because like she's kind of gotten – She's gotten better in the ring. She's been kind of overlooked. There, there's been kind of talk about her lately. She's got a great presence, I think, to me. And I think they just, like, sometimes I, I put in WWE just random stuff, like doing the exact opposite of what you think is going to happen. So, I mean, I want to Dana Brooke. I, I do agree with the Mandy Rose stuff that you said, though. I, I get it. She's a doppelganger of Trish Stratus. And they've been looking for a new Trish Stratus since Trish left. So maybe it's her. I, yeah, look, I, that's a very, very solid pick. Um, and you're scaring me with my pick because, (laughs) you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that stuff, but I'm sticking by it. I'm not changing it. No, I wouldn't either. Mandy Rose is a good pick. What scares me about Mandy Rose, though, is, long term anyway, not that she 
not, not that I think she may not win at uh, tonight, but what my problem is that they kind of sexified her to a way that made me have flashbacks back to, you know, the, the attitude era and really beyond that, where it, it was just kind of making women sex objects. And Mandy Rose with Corey Graves going bonkers over her and, and all that, like, I, I want her to feel more legitimate in the ring, and that's my holdup with her character. She's a good talker. I just am not a fan of, like, uh, look, I mean, I'm a guy, like, I'm a heterosexual guy, like, I, I, I'm married, like, I love women, of course, but, like, I don't watch wrestling to see that, like, I want to see these women who, of course, a lot of them are beautiful, but to me, it's about the in ring competition, and she feels like a little bit of a diva in a women's world right now. I want to see her transition to a full on badass woman. And I haven't quite seen that Dana Brooke is your pick and she's just in a weird place. I mean, she comes out there and, and a couple of weeks ago on the, uh, uh, a moment, a moment of bliss. And she says that, Oh, you guys all afford an opportunities. I don't get opportunities. I don't get opportunities. Well, First of all, you're in the woman, Money in the Bank women's ladder match. What are you talking about? You haven't won a match on Raw in about a year, and you get this opportunity, so I, your argument is just flushed down the toilet. So I'm not opposed to Dana Brooke winning. I think it would certainly put a jolt in her career that is all but on life support at this point. I mean, let's be honest. Um, she's super athletic. See the, I mean, look at the moves she does when she comes out on on stage for her entrance. When she does the aerial, like that's I couldn't even do that. The, like it, I, I, it makes me mark out. Like, and her music's really badass. I don't. Oh sure. I have like I have like a soft spot for her because I just feel that like. She hasn't been given the opportunity to shine. I know when everybody said she got called up to the main roster, it was too soon. It might have been. But, like, at the, at the same time, if you're looking at Mandy Rose, like, I get what you're saying about her being sexualized and stuff like that. She's still kind of green. She's a homegrown WWE product. But at the same time, as a woman, I feel like they're kind of going with that because it isn't – sexualizing her character is something that's not seen and it's not PC anymore, but it works for her. I'm, I'm going to go back. Like, Mandy Rose reminds me so much of Trish Stratus. It's, it's terrifying. And think about what they did to Trish, you know, like everything that Trish did. But the thing about Trish was that – is that she grew. And you saw her become this amazing woman's champion and, and the person that she is today, and she's – probably the greatest women's champion of all time in my personal opinion and i hated her when the attitude error was going on i was a huge lita person but in retrospect i love trish now i i get it and you saw her grow and they've been looking for that for so long and i think mandy rose is is solid in the ring i mean she still needs to grow and maybe she needs to get her character but maybe she needs to be sexualized in that way Uh, i don't think that sexualizing a woman is really bad unless like you know you're making them bark on the ground i i think that we've seen that which we've seen with Trish and like, look at her now. Like, I mean, she's, she's right up there. She's the God. Um, I, I think that it could work for Mandy Rose. If she wins, she's a great heel. She's got this, she's that girl at the bar that you want to punch in the face. And that works, you know, it, it works. But Dana Brooke, uh, I just have a soft spot for her. And I think if she had time and, you know, like with any of them, if they had time to work on their craft, they could be really good. And she's super athletic. And I think that she's a badass. And uh, I think she could, her and Mandy Rose are very interchangeable. The fact that I just think Dana Brooke has a little more edge on her because she is so athletic and stuff like that. And Mandy Rose is kind of just like, I was a fitness model and I'm walking into this exactly how Trish Stratus was. So I think it works either way. Yep. And, and, I mean, when you look at Trish Stratus' career, obviously she is a Hall of Famer. She is a Hall of Famer. She was one of the, if not the best, woman in the Attitude slash Reality Era or or whatever we called it after the um, era, Attitude Ruthless Era. I think. Aggression. Oh, ruthless aggression. That's right. When when John Cena came out, and then obviously that with whole thing with Kurt Angle. You're right. Ruthless aggression, and then the Reality Era, and then we get I don't know PG Era, whatever. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but. The advantage of Trish being in that era is she didn't have a whole lot of competition beyond the women who truly were just sex objects on TV, doing brawn panties matches, pillow fights, a live sex show. But that was the end of her career, though. Not really when she started out. I mean, you had Jacqueline. You had um, for Victoria. You had Molly Holly. They were all amazing 
women wrestlers and she was starting at nothing she grew in and grew past that and then they they took back the women's division they stepped it back i mean when she debuted when all that stuff was going on it was fierce competition there that was the last time before what we're seeing now since the women's revolution where woman wrestling was actually taken kind of seriously that stuff was still mixed in but there were i mean jacqueline lita like lita like bashing her face on a semi truck when they did hardcore matches and they still did intergender matches. You know, she kind of grew into that. It wasn't necessarily her, but yeah, she stood out when it grew into that era. Yeah. She, she made you care about the women's division in a way that was not typically presented as such. Like, yeah, I totally understand. They, she, her and Lita and Jackie and China to, to some extent, and China all, or if yeah. not her, absolutely China all legitimized the women's division at a time when it was mostly sexualized. So you're right. I mean, you're, that's a good point. I, you know, I just, as a whole, when you look at today's roster versus, you know, two thousands roster, I mean, it's, it's apples to pears. I mean, it's not even, it's not the same environment. You know, the, the athleticism of the women today, um, I don't even think it's an argument that it's, exceedingly better than the women of you know the 2000s but um so yeah okay you're going with mandy or i'm going with mandy you're going with dana brooke i somehow have a sneaking suspicion it'll be neither and it'll probably be like you know bailey or something or it could be nikki cross who then is manipulated further by alexa so i don't i don't even like the bailey argument though with the whole sasha Banks stuff that's going on i i just don't see bailey Uh, it but that's the only reason why but i i won't be surprised i this match is so it just feels like they were plugging in people like, like, okay, well, the two main women are champs or in a championship, you know, thing. Rousey's gone. We got Charlotte and, and Becky in a match. Who else? You know what I mean? So like, they just kind of pinpoint everybody. And it, it it's kind of sad, unfortunately, that like, they don't have other than Charlotte and um, Becky, they don't have some other stiff competition because it's it goes back to the argument attitude error. Like everybody was pushed or everybody was promoted and everybody had their stage. There wasn't really people who were just like, oh, they're putting that person in there. It, it, it's a weird it's a weird match. And it's been weird since they announced all the players in it. Yeah, it's a very odd combination. I, I agree. So let's move to the men's money in the bank ladder match. What's your take? Um, I think McIntyre is winning. <laughs> I, and I and I and and other than the fact that that guy needs to win it, and he his presence and his heel, oh, he's amazing. Like I stop if it's on in the background, I stop when he's on screen, even if he's saying nonsense. It just makes sense. Everybody else doesn't make sense to me. Finn's got a title. Sami Zayn is kind of in limbo right now. Ricochet would be my second pick. But I think they're just – they're not going to pull the trigger on that because they don't pull triggers like that anymore. It's got to be a very rare occasion that they pull a trigger on somebody who's so new to the roster. Um, Baron Corbin, ugh, I'm so, uh, he's doing his job good too. I'm, I'm so over it. Although I love the deep six. I, I love his moves. But And Randy Orton, like really? Randy Orton's there less than John Cena is. <laughs> like, <laughs> at least John Cena, Cena's, like, on, like, a mention, and he know you know he's on a leave. Like, Randy Orton just kind of comes in and does his thing, and he leaves, and he's Randy Orton. I mean, he's still phenomenal in the ring. He's a great worker and stuff like that, but Randy hasn't really done anything for me since he hasn't been the legend killer. And Andrade is still... And we're, we could talk about politics and stuff. He's still too green. He's still, his English isn't very good. I mean, Zelena Vega, I, I have been fortunate to know the woman behind her. I know uh, Thea, I've I've met her. I've, I've spent time with her. She's phenomenal. But how much can they do for her? Why isn't she in the money in the bank match for the women? It's, it's kind of like one of those things, like, they, they they curtail away from managers, and then they have, like, one or two managers. Like, they should go back into the manager thing because she's done wonderful things for him. He's a better Del Rio, but he's not up to that point that I think that he's going to hold the briefcase. So uh, my pick's McIntyre. It just seems like a dumb, like, like an absolute, you know, it's a no question. 
Uh, yeah, th- this is not going to be an inter- interesting pick or a uh, just to be uh, different. It's Drew McIntyre. It has to be Drew McIntyre. If, if anybody else wins this, I, I mean, I'm You'll just, be shocked. why? Why? Like, right? like everyone else, I'm sorry, no one else has the claim that Drew McIntyre does to this on top of the fact that he lost to Roman Reigns that we're all supposed to forget at WrestleMania. And I, I actually think it should have been the opposite of Drew going forward winning Absolutely. that match. But we all wanted the feel-good moment. Vince wanted to make sure everyone had a smile on their face and having Drew lose. But So Drew could really pick things back up here. He would be an awesome Money in the Bank briefcase holder from week to week, coming out, cutting promos, saying that you, when I'm, I'm coming for this, you nev- you'll never he's know when I'm coming scary, for this. scary, though, too. He, like, he's legitimately scary. Like, he fucking scare. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. That's okay. <laughs> he scares me. He legitimately scares me like he's just got this like I- i'm gonna i'm gonna murder you presence he's just scary and i think he would be a great briefcase holder yeah he has the authenticity and believability that not a lot of these guys do he has that since since he came back to wwe he is a changed man he's a guy that has a confidence he has he has that presence that you can't teach he's clearly gotten more muscular he's he's just got that killer instinct that that feel to him again you can't teach it and so uh, he would be an amazing money in the bank briefcase holder especially if you have a uh, a babyface champion that he's going after and threatening every week it's a great matchup um finn no he's got a championship and it just doesn't make sense so no um ricochet eh, too early andrade yeah i mean this, none of these other make sense. Uh, you could have Baron Corbin win two years in a row. My God, I shouldn't even speak that. <laughs> and, and then you have Randy Orton, who is simply there to figure. We're, we're all just he's there, so we can all imagine the craziest RKO that he's going to deliver. And it's probably going to either be to Ricochet or um, or Ali. Uh, so one of those two is taking probably an RKO off the rafters. I mean, it's, it's going to be something insane. That's what Randy Orton is there for, is to deliver the death-defying RKO out of nowhere at this point in his career. So Drew McIntyre keeps the or, or wins the Money in the Bank briefcase. Does he cash it in that night? I don't think so, but he's going to be a, a pleasure to watch after tonight. Absolutely. I totally agree. I didn't mention Ollie, too, who I absolutely love. I think he's great, but they're not going to give him the briefcase. It's just... It, I mean, going back to McIntyre, he was the chosen one, right? He left. I I don't understand how, like, Vince works with this Roman Reigns thing, and then he doesn't go back to the McIntyre thing. Like, this was supposedly the chosen guy, and, and now, in this interpretation, since he's come back, he has been the kind of chosen guy. He's kind of lurking in the rafters, but his presence is huge. And I just don't see anybody beating him, not even Randy Orton, as much, you know, as Randy Orton is a presence in the WWE. He's just he's not he's going to get knocked out by him. Yeah, no no question. Um, All right. So Mysterio and Samoa Joe. I I think Samoa Joe wins because Samoa Joe only wins at pay-per-views and gets his <laughs> ass kicked every other time that he's in a match. Gets rolled up, gets clean finished. Uh, he has one of the worst win-loss records of a champion in WWE history. It's It's a massive disservice to Samoa Joe, who came out with really guns blazing as Triple H is heavy, ends up facing Brock Lesnar, and to me at the time was one of the I was looking forward to that match so much. And when Brock Lesnar beat Samoa Joe, I was a bit disappointed. But at the same time, I loved Joe's comeback, which nobody talks about. And he said, Brock Lesnar, you didn't beat me. You escaped me. And that was just I was just like, so I was like, yes, like that's exactly who Samoa Joe is. Even in defeat, he's defiant. And I, I just it's just a disservice to see how many times the, the booking and the creative decide that it's OK to see Samoa Joe lose week after week after week. And it, it just takes away from his credibility. I mean, he comes back with an awesome promo and then gets his heat blown off because a baby face beats him. Roll up, whatever. And I'm just tired of seeing it. He's, he's a United States champion that never wins and somehow just squeaks by to retain the belt. I hate it. And I want to see Joe go on a tear, just running down. Like, And I thought they were going to do that at WrestleMania once he defeated Mysterio in record time. That, oh, this is now, okay, this is the reset button, the refreshing Joe. He's going to be a buzzsaw going through his competition. And that wasn't the case. So my prediction is that Samoa Joe wins. 
but it's probably going to be a competitive matchup in uh, in Rey Mysterio's defeat. Um, I totally agree with you. Joe is my pick. Um, touching on Samoa Joe, he's kind of he he's like Kevin Owens to me. Um, the two of them are probably the best people on the mic in the Federation right now. Um, in all of WWE, he he has been undeserved. Like they they have. They've run with it, but they haven't run with it. It's it's a weird thing. He is so good on the mic. His promos are just... You want to see him run through everybody. And he should. As I said earlier, him and Kevin Owens are the only two people that I could credibly believe seeing beat Brock Lesnar. And I was disappointed when he didn't beat Brock Lesnar also. Uh, He's a champion. I'm happy that he's a champion. It's a U.S. champ. I think Samoa Joe should have been WWE or Universal champ at this point. He Nobody can touch him. He has a presence. He's a monster. He's a great heel. He's doing some of the best work on the mic that he's probably done in his career. Even the AJ Styles uh, feud, when he was doing the whole thing with his wife, I was just like, yo... <laughs> like oh showing up at his house yeah, and, yeah yeah and like just talking about his wife like i loved it i thought it was great and i just don't understand why they don't see these things that the fans see and it, it can't just be about looks and stuff like that like he's a big samoan dude like look at all the other samoan dudes that have looked like him or his been as big as him they don't all look like the usos and more marines so yeah absolutely joe wins and it's just because also mysterio is just kind of enhancement talent right now he's like a randy orion like he puts people over um you know he's had his day I, mysterio is still great in the ring and it's going to be a good match but samoa joe is going to brutalize him and i don't know what's going on with his son storyline but there is no way that Mysterio becomes U.S. champ. I mean, but again, crazy things happen, so. Oh, Wendy, yes. Yeah, um, Wendy yeah. is amazing. Uh, well, wasn't that, I was just like so creepy, it's so creepy. I remember him showing up at his house and uh, like his front door and saying he think I don't know, Wendy's home or something, maybe I should go in. Like it was, it was definitely on the line of PG, like. Yeah. Because it was very suggestive, but it was awesome, and I loved it. I, Samoa Joe has so many talents that WWE He's so is not smart, maximizing. smart, though. That's yeah. the thing, too. Like, Kevin Owens is smart, but, like, Samoa Joe, the way he articulates and the way he says things, he's so smart when he says things, and he's so defensive when he says things that like you have to listen to him i'm not saying that that isn't the case with kevin owens but it's just a different it's a different level and they're both the two of them are the best on the mic in in the federation right now no question um all right so one match that got uh, added was the smackdown tag team championships with daniel bryan and rowan versus the usos um I, I mean, this is to me, I'm just going to hit it. And I, I really don't have a whole lot of logic behind it, but I think it's Daniel Bryan and Rowan who retain because they were just, they just earned the SmackDown tag team championships on top of the fact that the Usos are too busy doing comedy with the revival that they don't, they really at this point have been defined down to that. So I think Daniel Bryan and Rowan retain. I think that they have had some good chemistry. They've really started to take care of, Eric Rowan, oh no, just Rowan now. Everyone loses, you know, half Everybody a name. Everyone loses their fan. name. <laughs> They're like Andrade, uh, Cesaro lost a name. You had uh, Mustafa thing. Ali. I mean, it's just Ali now. I mean, I don't know why they do that. I mean, it's, it's, such it's a bizarre. Vince McMahon thing. That's the other thing, too. Like, when things like this happen, you're just like Vince. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it yeah it, 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 it's, <laughs> I have a feeling that Vince McMahon is behind that. But I, I think that they've, they've really reestablished Eric Rowan. I'm just going to say Eric Rowan because I don't know why. But right. they've established him as a much more credible threat than he has in the past when he was in the Wyatt family. And I think that's a good thing. They had him kick out of a finisher last week on SmackDown. That was surprising. They, they're they treating him like a monster. And I like that because he could be the guy that takes the hits for Daniel Bryan, the smaller heel champion, co-champion, that is is going to be really dishing out the the verbal piece of it, and Eric Rowan takes the the beatings and protects Daniel Bryan. It's a nice dynamic, and so I think they retain here, and I really don't think there's any question about it. Yeah, no, I agree. I had um, 
Daniel Bryan and Rowan uh, for multiple reasons. The Usos are multiple champions. I don't really know what they're going with. The, I, I know their faces right now, but that the whole revival stuff, like, it's just... Pfft. Daniel Bryan, Daniel Bryan, I love Daniel Bryan so much. I know, like, that sounds like kind of a Mark thing to say, but, like, when he went heel, I just remembered how good he, how much better he is as a heel than a babyface. And he's just been owning this thing. And, yeah, he he revitalized Rowan's career. Um, Rowan was misused in the Wyatt family. I mean, everybody was misused in the Wyatt family. Even Bray Wyatt was misused in the Wyatt family. So that's, that's an argument that you can't have. Um, they've, they've established him as a muscle and like shown his tattoos and stuff. It just gives him another level of belie- believability. Do, do you know what I'm saying? He just looks the part of a muscle and yeah, there's no rhyme or reason to it. They're going to win. He's great muscle for Daniel Bryan, and it's Daniel Bryan. Like, even though Daniel Bryan's not a face anymore, he's still one of the most popular people in the whole entire federation. The Usos don't need it. I, I don't even think that the that Daniel Bryan and Rowan need it. It just, out of the two, it makes sense for them to retain to establish their dominance. I don't know how long it's going to last, but I don't see the Usos winning. Like I said, they should be forming a faction with Roman Reigns, but who knows if that's going to happen. No, they, yeah, they did, right? The Bloodline, number a couple of years ago, they were the Bloodline. And uh, I think they would be much more suited in such a Well, they partnered a on SmackDown on Thursday, and I was just like, run with it. Like, just yeah, run with yeah. it. Just go yeah. with it, you know? And, yep. Um, and, you know, to, to your point about Daniel Bryan, yeah, I, I, him going heel, nobody thought a couple of years ago that, oh, my God, him turning heel would be awful. He'll, he'll never be able to do it. People He's won't go with it. Heel. And they have. Like Daniel Bryan turning the belt into the hemp belt, basically being this over-the-top vegan, holier-than-thou, all of you are just destroying the earth, he's the planet's champion. That's a, I mean, nobody's ever really done that. I loved it. No, and and Daniel Bryan, to his credit and his genius, has been able to to turn fans that have loved him so dearly with the Yes Movement through WrestleMania 30, through WrestleMania 31 when he won the IC title and then had to drop it again because due to injury, through retirement, through the return, all of it, he was able to turn that against the fans and have the fans boo him. And and it is just, it's a testament it's amazing. to Daniel Bryan. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. amazing because the other thing is, is that like I was just going to bring up is that um, Daniel Bryan seems like since he came back and after he won at 30, um, they've done all the right things with him. Like his yes thing was getting stale. Nobody was kind of, and then they tagged his wife onto it. And I hate to be a Bella basher, but I'm a Bella basher. Like Brie Bella, like destroyed his whole entire thing by taking his moves. And everybody was like, "Ah." and then she had all these mess ups. So when they turned him, I was like, holy crap. They actually were like, Oh, we got to save him. And they like put him as importance. It wasn't so much that they didn't know what to do with him. They were just like, Daniel Bryan's a talent and we know he can work with this. I mean, go back to the stuff when he was feuding with punk and, um, being with AJ Lee, he was great as a heel. He was amazing, you know? So it's, it's really, really good to see that he has that power. He's one of the few people that have that power in, in WWE. Definitely. And while we're speaking about the Wyatt family a little bit off, off oh, topic, I was going to bring but, this up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because this is, this is the, the, the one thing I want to talk to you about before we close things out is the Firefly Funhouse. Now, mm-hmm. I have been, and I've said many times that even from week one, I said it's weird. It's a, it's a very startling difference from what he was as the eater of worlds. And he comes out in a, a sweater vest and basically a faux children's show and all that. And I said that this is, while it may not make a whole lot of sense, and you may think they're destroying his character, I said we're all talking about it. It had the highest number of views on WWE's YouTube. It was the talk of Raw that week, and it continued to be. And obviously, we're in the third and fourth week now, and. This week, we got to see what he was up to with that the mask that, I mean, everyone is talking about it. It was developed by a, a movie, um, a, a, I don't know, the guy who developed Andy. Leatherface and all that. Yeah, like, he whoever, did the Slipknot masks. Yeah. So, I mean, it was clearly the talk of the, the WWE this week. I'm loving this. How it's going to translate into the ring, I don't know. But So, kind of a two-part question. Number one, do you think that we see... Bray Wyatt in some capacity tonight 
And also, what is your overall feeling on this this change of character for Bray? Um, I think we see him tonight. I don't know where. I don't know if it's going to be Dirty Daniel Bryan's match because of Rowan, because of the connections, or if he's just going to show up to mess stuff up, like just to be like, hey, I'm here. Um, as far as how I feel about it, it's good. Um, I loved the whole idea of the Wyatt family when it started. Um, Bray Wyatt was done a disservice by the WWE as soon as he got to the main roster. I mean, I know, again, it's, it's an NXT main roster thing. The guy is so creative. I've been reading stories since the mask uh, debuted on Monday. Um, this was all him. This was all him. Um, he, this was his idea. He reached out to people and he made it happen. And he's such a good promo person. He's good in the ring. He's solid. I mean, he's a legacy. Yeah. But like, you don't even remember his legacy. And it's just, I'm glad that he's trying to refresh himself. I love it because I'm a weirdo and I like all that like serial killer cult stuff. And he's totally trying to like lure children in and it's kind of questionable and it's borderline and it's risky, especially when you're supposed to be putting out a PG product and they're moving with it. And if they do it right, it, it, it could be huge, but I, I, I love it. I, I was kind of like on the fence at first because I didn't know what was going on when we, they were doing the teaser promos for a couple of weeks when they were just showing like the doll and the vulture and stuff. I was like, this has to be Bray Wyatt. Who else would this be? So, you know, it matches it matches to his identity and stuff like that. But, yeah, they they need to reinvent Bray Wyatt because he got he got screwed. Like to put it point blankly they made him a joke they didn't know what to do with him and i don't know if it was creative i know it wasn't him you know but somebody like blocked him when he was trying to move forward and i think it's a good revival for it and we just gotta wait and see um he's terrifying but i i love it i think it's great i i like when they do weird things within wrestling and I definitely think he shows up tonight, though. I mean, if he doesn't, then he'll show up tomorrow night. But I think that it's kind of since he debuted the other persona and showed his other side of himself, he's got to show up tonight. Right. I would think that um, the only thing that would make me hesitant is that he just had his baby girl. I think. Yes. Um, so maybe he's taking a couple of days off and he'll have a, a, another uh, episode of the Firefly Funhouse tomorrow night on Raw. I mean, that that's a possibility. Um, odds are, I would think, that at least via satellite or via vignette, he will be in spirit. I don't think he'll physically show up. I'll, I mean, I wouldn't, again, bet the house on it. But I, I think that in some capacity we get another episode or a flash or something. Uh, I, I'm loving this as just as you are. The Eater of Worlds kind of ran its course. And you could say he got screwed by WWE. And in some capacity, I think that they did misbook him, misuse him, all of that. That's true. Um, but the the fact that every single week we would get the, the backstage promo with that Edison bulb above his head and he'd talk in riddles and we're all supposed to decode it and, and all this stuff. It's like it got a, I honestly started to tune it out and he just would laugh maniacally or say wrong I, I, and the, the promo just, would end. Yeah, no, I'm the same way with you. I mean, it got to the point where like I'm a huge horror movie fan and like all that stuff and like weird things. And I was just like, I'm scarier than him. Like he lost this credit like when he kidnapped Daniel O'Brien and he like showed up on Raw a week later and he was he was fine like and there was no explanation but I don't necessarily think that so much it was them I just I there's confines that like they they don't know what to do with characters like that like they're really good characters and they have really good ideas but they're so worried about harming the younger audience or like scaring them off that they stopped doing these things. Is it like a, a stop pause or whatever? And now this is clearly trying to like brainwash your children. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> Mr. Rogers on acid and 
they're going with it. It's just, how is it going to turn out? Is it going to be a forgotten thing? Or are they going to have a horror house, whatever they did with Randy Orton, where they're like projecting worms on a, on a, on a oh ring mat, God. which was well, he burned terrible. That house down, so. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It, like I'm supposed to be afraid, that. right. Of like, a, it, basically, yeah, it comes, you know, horror is a weird thing. Like it becomes cheesy and campy and it becomes unbelievable. Like it, it they just didn't know what to do with him. Like, I was at the pay-per-view where he came out of the lantern. I was at, I think it was Extreme Rules, whatever with John Cena. And I was like, you're really doing this right now? Uh, uh, it was just. It, with the kid who was just standing there, yeah, like stone-faced. One of those. Like, I was yeah. at one of those pay-per-views and I was in the audience and I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. So hopefully they let him run with this. But, you know, the guy who, behind Bray Wyatt is great. And this is when it comes to politics of just letting people do what they need to do and like run with it and see what happens. You can always ax it if it doesn't work after they do their ideas. Things can't be so constricted. That's when bad stuff happens. No, I'm I'm really excited to see where this goes. Like every week I'm like, oh, I can't wait for the Firefly Funhouse. And I I love the music they even have. Like, uh, I I don't know the lyrics. It's uh, like, I I don't know. I don't know the lyrics, but uh, it's so catchy that it does sound like a legitimate kids show. And yes, bringing kids in is extremely risky. And it's it's a very fine line. You have to be very careful anytime you're bringing kids onto TV at, at all, especially in a PG product in a very PC world that everyone's concerned about everything and so sensitive. You have to be very very careful what you do with these kids. And he had kids on his show that were just sitting there, just That's blank so staring. Neat. And nothing. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I I I have to. I, it was just awesome to have them just all sitting there like they were hypnotized, not moving, not staring, not making a, a, anything. I don't think any one of them even blinked. It was it was great bringing them in. Again, they need obviously they need to be very careful with bringing kids in anything, but uh, I loved it. I just hope they have a clear direction. I hope Bray Wyatt has a clear direction for this character, this new reboot of who he is, and he's able to harness his character. That's a nuance I like too. That he's he's not just always this maniac that uh, has a scary clown face on you know a mask on. I like that he says he learned he's learned how to harness it. So does that mean he's kind of like controlled the rest of the time? And when, you know, maybe he comes out in a sweater vest and when someone provokes him, he, you know, he ends up turning into this monster. I don't know. But the fact that he says he's learned to harness at this time is, I think, a key phrase as well. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I, I'm curious to see where it goes and hopefully we will see more. And I just hope that he doesn't have another curse on him because I think that he's truly one of the best talents that they have in the whole entire WWE right now no question um so i think we've got everything in here um man it's been (laughs) this is this sometimes i mean wrestling takes you in very strange places in very strange conversation but it's all awesome Uh, no no it's fine um so uh any other anything else before we close things out that you wanted to talk about no that's it i just want to see uh how they're going because like i said earlier like when we started the show it's in a weird place right now with like politics becoming more than the show and i just hope that they have a really good pay-per-view today because it's an important pay-per-view for the rest of the year and then oh wait we got to be very quiet when we say this but next next month they're in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, um, well, it, let's not mention that. <laughs> which it's kind of like the pay per view that doesn't really matter for pay per views because it's its own world and you have these fantasy matches that don't really matter for anything and are, are just, stretches and they're old. It, <laughs> it's bizarre. I mean, you have Undertaker versus Goldberg, fifteen years too late. Yep. You, I mean, you have like like what what what's going on? Like I don't understand the the fascination. It, Saudi Arabia must be shelling out a crap load of money to WWE you to bring these stars it's a in. Crap load of money. The, that's the only reason these things are happening, and it's very controversial. And that's another podcast. But I I didn't even watch the one last year. I just kind of ignored it. It, so oh, the, the crown jewel the the the, the two yeah. words that wwe like to scrub from their memory mm-hmm. um yeah it, it's and they're going back and they have more than I, I think they had a total of like 10 shows that they agreed to do there so i mean even after this one they got eight more to go i believe so saudi arabia isn't going anywhere but it's funny the graphic that wwe put up it said like uh the super show um uh, I, I forget the name of the actual pay-per-view i think it was like the 
Super Showdown, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Super Showdown. And and who where they said it was was in the smallest text you could possibly come up with, and it said like Jedi or something. Mm -hmm. But they didn't even say Saudi Arabia. They just put like the the name of the city and the the arena or the stadium. They just will not put Saudi Arabia. And I understand why. It's just very uh, ironic that that they don't even publicize where it's at. They'll just say the name of the city, and you're just supposed to just know where that is. So um, they are trying to distance themselves from the last disaster that was Crown Yeah, but Jewel. they already signed into it, and they could pull out of it, and they could. Vince McMahon could pull out of it. The company could pull out of it, but they choose to do that, and, you know, that's well, yeah. that's a that's a they, moral they could. money thing that you could talk about for hours, but it's I, I don't want to see – Honestly, in general, I don't want to see The Undertaker wrestle anymore. I want him to be retired sitting on his lawn, like, playing with his kids. Like, they just yep. keep dragging him out. And, you know, what happens if he really gets hurt one day? Yeah. So it's just yeah. – it's 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 a contentious thing with me. So It is, and I love The Undertaker, and I, I selfishly would – I like this to watch him wrestle. But at this point, it's painful to watch him wrestle. And I don't want to just – I don't want to – change the memory that I have of the undertaker of who and what he was to what he's become now. And it's just a shell of himself. Yep. And, and I, I hate it. I hate it because I feel embarrassed and I feel just, I feel like I'm watching this going, okay, is he going to get hurt this move? Is he actually going to yeah, get hurt now? Absolutely. Like, I, I'm right. like, I feel like he's so brittle. Match. You're yeah. the whole entire match. Send Hogan out there. He wants to do that. Stuff. Uh, yeah, Hogan would do it until he's dead. I mean, uh, Hogan. Uh, yeah. Um, but as, <laughs> as long as I don't have to see Shawn Michaels bald head again, oh, coming out of retirement, terrible. please. That was so distracting. Like, I know that that shouldn't distract me, but it took away from the match. So it takes much away from Shawn Michaels. Like yeah, the guy it, it, had integrity. He's one of the greatest uh, of all time. And like, you're watching, him as an old man uh, like the undertaker can kind of hide it with like makeup and stuff like that but like just let him be man you don't need them this goes back to you know utilizing your talent and and actually making him worth and don't make him a joke like yeah, yeah. it's it's a sad thing politics and like, wrestling <laughs> i'm just pretending that never happened because to me Shawn michaels stayed retired and you did not do that like absolutely in my mind my mind never happened so um mary listen it's been awesome um before we end things out though let everyone know where they can get in contact with you uh you guys can follow me on twitter at mayor bear mayor underscore bear i'm sorry m-a-r-e underscore underscore sorry b-a-r-e and on Instagram at Poppins311. And it's been so awesome talking to you for like two hours. Yeah, I know. Wrestling. See, this is what happens. Like wrestling just <laughs> takes away. Like it's like you're in a time warp when you talk about wrestling because you get so involved in it and it takes you back. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. We'll have to do this again for sure. Um, and it's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real privilege. <laughs> All right, now go and watch go watch Money in the Bank and let's see how we I do have with to our start predictions. It from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I back to me it too. The whole time. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Great. Thank right, you. Bye. Bye. Yep. Bye. All right, guys. So you got to check out this website. It's called RoyalOutlets.com. So what exactly is it? Well, they got a bunch of stuff that they sell that's really high quality. But one of the things I want to talk about is a back posture brace. So why does this matter? Well. Most of us have issues with back posture. We may, we may not even know it. And there's a product that they sell there. It's the Back Posture Brace. It comes in all different sizes. So small, medium, large, extra large, XXL, you name it, they got it. It also has fast, free shipping. So you got to really check this out. So what exactly does this have? Well, and what does it do? It improves your standing posture by using this the posture corrector. And it'll be aligned and trained to your back muscles to achieve a long-lasting, healthy posture every day. So... It is also adjustable, it's comfortable, it's the perfect fit. Other consumers claim they fit most body types, but they offer products that only fit for smaller body types. They can guarantee that their product sizes will fit effectively on plus size and regular size body types. So check them out. It's a 100% satisfaction guarantee as well as a 30-day money back guarantee. So check it out at royaloutlets.com and fix your posture today. So we all know that CBD oil has been legalized, and I use it myself. My wife uses it. It's great to calm your nerves and, and really eliminate anxiety. It's going to really help you guys out, I, I promise you. So there's a, a website that offers it, and I've, I've tried it, and I can tell you that it's 
it's the real deal. It's USCBDoil.co. US cbdoil.co but beyond helping with anxiety what else does it do well it promotes natural sleep hormones regulates stress hormones as i talked about it also improves extinction extinction learning which is the reprogramming of the brain's response in certain circumstances so check this out guys it helps fight cancer it lowers the risk of diabetes and obviously pain relief and inflammation and depression so there's really no risk here, guys. Check out uscbdoil.co today. 